If you brought your Bibles, uh, please get them out, turn them on. If they're electronic, head on over to Acts uh, chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. So we are kind of looking at what it means to be with. What it means to be with. Uh, I think we all agreed last week we've kind of lost sight of what it means to be with one another, uh, what it means to be with God. Uh, and, and I said, I don't know if everybody agreed, but this is the main culprit of what inhibits our ability to be with. Uh, with God and with others and not condemning technology because technology has its uses. Uh, and I think back to COVID, right? Don't worry, I'm not going to get political. I'm not going to talk about any of that. But we, moved, Freedom Church moved into this building. We started the church back in 2018. At the end of 2019, we started to meet in this building, in this facility, gathering here together. And then what happened in March of 2020, like three months later, everything shut down, right? Churches closed their doors. We weren't meeting together. And, and so for us introverts, it was really cool for about a week. And then even us introverts were like, man, there's, there's just something missing. And we would gather together on Zoom. We, would, uh, we, we had our worship gathering on Facebook and YouTube, but, but there was just something missing. Right. And I remember we as a leadership team, we were talking about, hey, when when should we start meeting again together? When should we start gathering together? And it's like every week was like, is, is this the week? Is this the week? Is this the week? And then COVID, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. So we finally just decided, you know what? We miss being together. So we're going to start gathering back up. And I think one of the greatest surprises for me is when we started back up, we had families walk through the door. It's like, oh, who are you guys? And they're like, oh, well, we've been attending here for months. I'm like, well, I'm the pastor. I've never seen you. Uh, but they were like, we just want to be with a local church. And so we, that, that's, I think some of you guys started attending right around that time. The, the dinner we had for Christmas, I think, is when you guys showed up for the first time. And so it's this idea of being with. And so I'm, I challenged you last week to kind of look at what it means to be with God, what it means to remain, to abide. And, and remember, it's not... It's not you doing more. It's not you praying more, reading the Bible more, doing this. And those are good things. And I don't think I communicated that well last week. Prayer and reading your Bible and, and you know, communing with God, those are good things. But that's not how we earn anything. It's a component of being with, right? Um, and so husbands and wives, you know, uh, how do you spell? Oh, my gosh. In a marriage, how do you spell love? It's not L-O-V-E. It's T-I-M-E. Time. And it's that way in any relationship. You've got friends, right? Like I have a friend, uh, best friend for 20 years. And it's like, no, he was my best friend 20 years ago. We just haven't spent time together. Uh, but when you get together with people, when you are with one another, you just feel joy. You just feel happier. And life's not all about feelings, but you, you learn things. You learn things about people. You learn things about yourself. And, and so today we're going to look at an example in scripture of the early church, how they were with one another. And the danger when we look at a passage like what we're going to look at today, there's a couple dangers. First of all, that it's very familiar to us. So we kind of skip over some of the stuff. And the second danger, and this is one that the sermon rumble talked about this week, um, I realize some of you are probably like, what's the sermon? So there's, there's some of us that get together that talk about the sermon prior to preaching it. And so that's the sermon rumble. But as we were talking, the, the other danger we identified was when we read this passage, we're going to be like, man, that sounds good. There's no way I can do that. There's no way that I can live in that type of community. And so then you're faced with the option. What do you do? If the Bible is saying this is a good thing and you're like, man, I can't do it. What do you do? Do you just put this aside and say it's not relevant? It doesn't work. Or I think the more appropriate question is to start to ask why? Why can't we live that way? Why can't we experience what these people experience? Why can't we see this? And so as we look at the passage today, those are just some things I want you to keep kind of in the back of your mind, because we're going to look at a kingdom minded local church. And so this is going to 
continue the dialogue, continue the conversation that we're having here at Freedom Church of what it means to, to be a church, what it means to do church, what it means to do life together. And this passage. So the other thing I wanted to, to mention, when we plan in Freedom Church, everybody gave me all these books on church planning. This is, this is how you plant a church. And probably the most helpful book was um, a church planting slightly preferable to unemployment. That was probably the... Uh, my favorite book, but church planting, it, it, it was hard. They, they also gave me books on church health and church growth and all of this. Um, and what one of, uh, one of the mentor, one of my mentors said was, was what's wrong with the Bible? Why don't you look at what the Bible says about what it means to be a healthy church? And I'm like, you know what? You're right. And this is one of those passages that talks about what it means to be a healthy church. So we at Freedom Church, we've never focused on numbers. We, we've never focused on we need to get more and more people. It's always been how can we be healthy? How can we be healthy people? How can we be a healthy church? How can we serve the community? Uh, and things like that. And so that's, that's my idea. Uh, and that's my thoughts going forward. And the other thing is when we read this passage, there's, there's going to be something called context that's incredibly important. Sometimes you can take a Bible verse and you can rip it out of the Bible and you can make the Bible say anything you want. And I use this example often. The Bible actually says there is no God. Did you know that? But the context of that verse is what? A fool says in his heart, there is no God. All right. So you need the context of verses. You need the context of Scripture. And so when we look at this, we need to understand what it meant in the time when it happened before we can understand what it means for you and I today. And that's just basic Bible interpretation. That's why in Scripture, when it says, go sell all your possessions, which is a passage we're going to look at today, we're going to ask, was that describing what they did? Or is that prescribing something for you and I to do? Right? And those are some tough questions, because there's some hard things in Scripture, aren't there? And so we need to ask those questions. And that's one of the reasons it's so important to be with people. I can't tell you the number of times I've read something in scripture and I've been like, oh man, this is so cool. That means I need to go do this, 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 and this, and this, and this. And then I start to talk to somebody who is maybe a little bit more grayer than me. And they're like, hold up. That's not what that means. I'm like, well, it says it. Well, yeah, but let's, let's look at everything else. You'll hear the phrase, the whole counsel of Scripture, right? And so we, we take in the whole counsel of Scripture. Because if, if you don't take in the whole counsel of Scripture, what you have is at the end of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, you have snake handling. You will never see me in a church that does snake handling. First of all, I hate, absolutely hate snakes. And Kelly's over there like, yeah. And second of all, it's in the Bible, but it's not biblical. So there, that's, that's one of those, the whole counsel of Scripture, right? And so this is one of those passages. So what we have in Acts, uh, this is the, the Luke's account of, of the, the start of the early church, the growth of the early church, some of the activities that the, that the early church was doing. Uh, and so we get little snippets here and there. So at the, at the time Jesus died, at the end of the Gospels, there was about 120 believers in Jesus. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Savior, um, that he died for their sins. There was about 120 of them. And then Peter... If you remember Peter, he was the one that, that always put his foot in his mouth. He spoke too soon. He spoke without thinking. Uh, he was kind of a brash guy. He liked to fight. He liked to, you know, he was just kind of rough around the edges. Um, Peter stands up at Pentecost. You've got all these Jewish people around, thousands of people in town, and he preaches a sermon. 3,000 people come to faith in Christ. So the church goes from 120 to over 3,000 from Peter preaching. Now, we're 40, 50 people. If we went from 40, 50 people to even 100, we'd be like, uh, what are we going to do? But to go from 100 to 3,000, the church leaders, the apostles and disciples are like, what do we do? So this is a, this is a description of kind of what happens after that. And so chapter 2, look at verse 41 with me. It says, Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 people. Woo! So what do they do? Verse 42, we're going to read all the way through the end of, of chapter 2. 
and then we'll come back. Verse 42, all the believers, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Whew. You'll notice in your Bibles there's headings above some passages. Not all Bibles have the headings and not all Bibles have the same headings. That's why they're usually in italics because they're not part of Holy Scripture. But the title for this passage is The Believers Form a Community. The Believers Form a Community. And we often talk here at Freedom Church about what it means to be a community. We want to be in the community and for the community and with the community. And so here, Peter preached at Pentecost. And what the passage just before this, he preached from Joel chapter 2 and Psalm chapter 16. So when we get to verse 42 and it says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You should stop and say, what, are they, what is that? What is the apostles' teaching? Because when Peter preached, they didn't have the Bible in the pew underneath where you could pull it out and read it. They didn't have that. They had what, the, what, they had what we call the Old Testament. And so Peter stood up. He was talking to Jews. He speaks from Joel chapter 2. He re, pretty much verbatim says it, and then he, he just gives a couple of sentences about it. Then he jumps into Psalm 16 and talks a little bit more about that, and then people get saved. Because he's preaching from the Old Testament. But it says the apostles' teaching. So these apostles, these are the, the, the 12, and then after Judas betrayed Jesus, it became 11, and then they appointed a 12th person. These apostles walked with Jesus. They spent time with Jesus. That's why we started last Sunday talking about with God. They spent time with Him. So Jesus, you imagine they had to walk 10 miles, right? Nazareth to Jerusalem, I think, is 10 miles. They walked that, and they didn't walk in silence. They walked, and they talked. And they walked thousands of miles together. That's why it's so encouraging to me. I think one of the best things the body of, of believers that we can do together is just simply walk. You imagine if we had a Freedom Church walking club, 6 a.m. every morning. We're going to meet out there. We're going to pray, and then we're going to walk. Kent's going to lead it because I sleep till 7. But <laughs> 6 a.m. All right. Just walk and talk like, hey, how's your day? How was your evening? Did you sleep well? What's going on? That would be so much fun. Mm -hmm. You guys have to stay off your feet, though, for a while. So get you a wheelchair out there. Yeah. <laughs> so this apostles teaching, it's them talking about the Old Testament. It's them explaining their time with Jesus. But it's also more than that, because we have the New Testament today. So a lot of these apostles would go on to write what we have in the New Testament. So the Gospel of Matthew is written by the Apostle Matthew. John was written by the beloved disciple, the beloved Apostle John, right? Mark was a close associate of Peter, also a close associate of Paul. Luke, also in that group, not one one of the 12, but still very connected to the group. And then Paul wrote about 13 letters. John wrote some. Peter wrote some. The brother of Jesus wrote some. Jude, who we think is another brother of Jesus, wrote. So all of these people were connected to Jesus. They were with Jesus. And so their teachings, their letters became part of the New Testament. They, become, they became part of the apostles' teaching. So these folks were devoted to it. They continued steadfast in it. And what that means is they didn't just go listen to Peter preach. These people heard and they obeyed. And I think we've lost that in the American church. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them what? Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. It's not to know. It's not to study. It's not to hide in the library and just read about it. It's teach them to obey all that Jesus commanded. But I want to be careful here. Jesus is talking about believers. 
It's not talking to unbelievers. This is the believers forming a community together and devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. So these are people that have already trusted Christ for forgiveness. They've already been set free. And now they obey. And you cannot get the cart before the horse. There's a lot of religions. There's a lot of cults. There's a lot of people out there that confuse works with salvation. That I have to work my way into God's good graces. Can't happen. That I have to work to prove this or to prove that. And I'll pick on Mormons for a little bit because they're one of the groups that do. Have you ever met a Mormon you didn't like? On it, let's be honest. There's a couple here and there, right? But the reason we like most of the Mormons is because if you were trying to earn favor with God, you'd be pretty nice too. <laughs> Seriously. But Christians, that doesn't give you a reason to be mean. <laughs> All right, we're to be nice, we're to serve and love others, we're to care for other people. But these folks, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So that's another reason why we can't expect non-believers, unbelievers, people who reject God to conform to the New Testament. These people, these believers, they felt the need to learn together, to encourage, to refocus on Jesus, to refocus on the resurrection of Christ, to praise and petition him. And, and that's why a church has to focus on the teaching ministry, has to focus on the doctrine of the church, because you are taught doctrine in the songs that you sing, in the words that you are taught, in the books that you read, in the observation of the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's why teaching ministry is important. But you can't have doctrine if you don't have love. Because if you just have doctrine, you're going to be beating people over the head in an unloving, ungracious way. That's why Paul tells Timothy to watch your life and doctrine closely. You need both. And a good church does that. So that's teaching. Oh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And to fellowship. That's the Greek word koinonia, if you've ever heard that. But that's a deep desire to be with the people of God. To be with the people of God. When you aren't present with the people of God, and I'm not talking about just Sunday morning, I'm talking about every day with the people of God, the church is missing something. <clears throat> sometimes, and I'm just going to use Sunday morning as an example, sometimes when you miss Sunday morning, you may be missing an opportunity to minister and love someone else. You may be the person that God has decided to put into someone's life that day to share a word of encouragement, to share a word of challenge. And so it's so important to gather together with the church family where we share ideas, we share attitudes, we share purposes, we share a mission and we share activities. We participate with, we participate together. And when I read this, when I, when I read this verse, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, to prayer. Awe came over the people. They met together. They were together in one place. They shared things. They sold stuff and gave to one another. That, to me, is describing more than just actions that they did, but that's describing a heart for people. That's describing a heart for people. So I could stand up here. I could give you guys your checklist of things to do every day individually. I could give you a checklist of what to do here at the church building. I could give you a checklist of what to do at work. But that's not nearly as important as having a heart to be with people. Parents, I could tell you, here's a good book to read on parenting. Uh, you follow these 10 steps, you're going to have perfect kids. And all the parents that are born in reality know that that's not the case. But it'll make you feel better. Go to bed at night. Yep, I did these 14 things for my kid today. They're going to grow up and feel a secure love. If you are not with your kids, if you are not with your spouse, if you are not with your friends, those books, those steps don't matter. They don't. It says you have to be with. You have to have a heart. You have to think about what it means to be with people. And this is why when we talk about, and we're going to do this next week and following, and we've done it in the past, when we talk about the values of the church, 
It's not the values of this building. It's the values of us as a church. There should be no difference in the values that you hold when you think of church and the values you hold when you think of family or work and things like that. The values should be the same. But this idea, and this is where it's important to understand context. When it says that they were in fellowship, and then in verse 44 it says all the believers met together. That actually is all the believers were together. You and I have no context for that. We don't. The Jewish community that Peter was talking to and that, that this is describing, they lived together. Their front doors were five feet apart from one another. They did not have garages. They did not have privacy fences. They did not have automobiles. They, did not, they didn't have any of that. When they went to the market, they stepped out the door. The women went together. They talked as they were going to the market. The men would get on the fishing boats and spend time together. They were with one another. We do not get that here in the States. We don't understand. It. So is it, this is one of those cases. Are we going to set this aside and say, oh, that sounds like a nice dream? Or are we going to ask ourselves the hard question of why can't we live like this? In those days, when somebody knocked on your door, you opened the door. If it was a friend, if it was a family member, if it was a stranger, guess what? They got treated the exact same way. Come inside, let's have some tea, let's eat some food together. If you need a place to stay, I have no idea who you are, but there's the bed, stay. What happens in the United States when you knock on a stranger's door? You get shot. You might get killed and then you get your head full. Yeah, we have... So what does this look like for us? This is me asking because I don't have a good answer. A lot of times pastors will say, oh, that means, you know, this. Uh, I honestly don't know. I don't know. And that's a, that's a conversation. Yeah, go football. That's a conversation I want to have over the next six months is, is how do we do this? How do we be with one another? Right. I think I, I could get up here and I could say, oh, that means when you make a meal, make extra food and just invite people over. I don't, I don't know. That may be the case. I don't I don't know. But let's let's talk about how we can have a heart for people, a heart to be with people and what that looks like for Freedom Church in 2023. OK, are you guys OK with that? Yeah. You OK with me not having the answer? All right. Whew. Pressure's off. All right. <laughs> but it would go on in, in verse 42. That part of this fellowship, part of this koinonia, part of this group together was sharing in meals together, including the Lord's Supper. So they ate together. Uh, they celebrated communion together. And this wasn't just something that they tacked on at the, extra, at the end of a meal. This was something that, that they did. And so when you break bread with one another, when you celebrate communion with one another, when was the last time you had someone over for dinner and then had, had communion afterwards, right? shared a, a, a glass and broke some bread and just talked about, it's not the elements, but it's talking about what they represent. And that's the broken body and the shed blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Have a meal and talk about Jesus. But they also prayed together in prayer. And this is something that a church family desperately needs is prayer. This type of community in verse 43, it led to a deep sense of awe. Because where God works, lives are going to be touched in miraculous ways. And this awe, and this is really the heart of what this passage is. This is a group that knew what oneness was. This was a group that was truly unified. This was a group that understood what self-sacrifice was. See, these people were giving of their excess, but they were also selling other stuff and giving it to people. But it wasn't just handing it out. This isn't communism. This isn't socialism. This was voluntarily selling things and giving to people in need. So when we get to verse 44, all the believers were together or met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. This is mutual care. This is mutual concern. 
And as we see later in Acts chapter 6, the, the needy people that would come to the church gatherings, there was a daily distribution. It wasn't a weekly distribution. It was a daily distribution of foods of goods, of money, of things that they needed. So there was some sort of organization to it. It wasn't just somebody selling stuff and then throwing money in the air and you grabbing as much as you can. There was organization. There was purpose behind it. Finish this statement. They will know you are Christians by your love. I thought it was they will know you are Christians by the amount of protests that you do. <laughs> They will know you are Christians by the hate that you show on social media for groups of people. No? The American church is more known for what we are against than what we are for. And that's not right. They will know we are Christians by our love. I look at the people in Freedom Church. There is no reason for us to be friends in the world standards. We're all different. We're all misfits, right? We all come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. We all live in different areas. We all have different careers. But when I look at you guys and I see you and watch you guys interact with one another, I see a community of people that genuinely love one another. It's because we all have the same dad. Thank you, Alfred. And that would be God the Father. But we're all part of the family, right? And one thing I know about family is you can't choose your family. And let's be honest, if you could, some of your brothers and sisters you would not choose, right? But we are part of the family of God. And so we are to be with one another. So this causes, verses 44 and 45, cause me to ask the question, is Jesus more important than my possessions? We say that. We say yes to that. Alfred, what if God asks you to give your PS4 to, to me this week? <laughs> I've asked several times for a Tesla, and y'all have not put a Tesla key in the offering yet. <laughs> but no, no joke. Like, what, what, if, what, if this, no, what if this week, as you're praying, God convicts you of something and says, you know what, I should give this to so-and-so? If your answer is not immediately, okay, God, that thing might have a grip on your heart. I see this with kids and electronics, right? How many of us grew up without a cell phone? Okay, quick, w Kelly, how old were you when you got your first cell phone? Nella, you can't put your hand up. You're growing up with a phone. Kelly, how old were you when you got your first cell phone? Yeah. And it was in a bag. It was in a, about this big. Yeah. Alfred, how old were you? 1989. You were, oh, there's no way. It, it was a prepaid phone, and the cost number was 300 bucks. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember this is going to floor a lot of you young people. You used to have to pay per minute for your phone. It was, and it was also 10 cents a text message. I remember when, when I got my first phone that was able to text messaging, my first cell phone bill was $1,200. <laughs> I went to AT&T and I was like, this is not going to, no. <laughs> and then a few years later, Unlimited came out. But it was, do you guys remember when it was Unlimited, but only after 5 p.m.? Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, where was I at with this? Why did I bring this up? Oh, selling things, selling things. So if, if God asks you to just give something away, right? Give it away. Let, let that go. And we've got some excellent examples of, of folks doing that in this faith family today. They don't want me to mention it because it's bragging and all of that. But, but give stuff away. Give it away, right? Some of you are going to be like, well, Scott, you need to give away your books. I'm like, I have, but not all of them. Anyway, <laughs> give it away. Then we get to this in verse, so, so that, that part of, of lit, we're going to talk about more about that next week, about what it means to be with people and how we can bless one another with possessions and with goods and things like that, because the heart behind it, we don't want people, well, no, we'll talk about that next week. I almost said something I didn't agree with. All right, verse 46, they worshiped together at the temple each day. That's another thing we don't have context for, do we? 
How many of you are here at the temple, at the, at the building every day? We, this is a Jewish community, so it's a little bit different, right? Because we are the temple of God. So we are every day worshiping at the temple. Met, they met in homes. They met from house to house for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals. And so there again, food is mentioned twice. The, um, they shared their meals with great joy and generosity great joy and generosity. So we sang that song about being joyful. We sang that song about uh, the celebration and what it means to be in the kingdom and let your kingdom come, let your will be done. All of that. This is, this is that idea of joy and generosity. That, that word generosity actually means singleness of heart. And so they were, well, you know how sometimes you have people come over and you're feeding them, but your heart's not really in it. Yeah. You're like, man, they're eating my stuff. And you come to the Maxon house and you touch my jalapeno poppers, my heart's not going to be in it. <laughs> but this singleness of heart, right? You're just opening your home and you're saying, here, this is my food. This is what I have. Just kind of eat and, and enjoy and just let's just be together. Let's be with one another. No agendas, no timetables, no, I hate clocks. And don't tell my wife I said that, right? We need to be together with one another daily, being joyful, keep it simple, and, and, and living a lifestyle together. And in this culture, when you ate together, it was more than just a meal. It was saying, I am committed to you. You are committed to me. We are wholesome. We have this well-being. We are together, all right? I'm trying to teach my kids this so that when like yesterday, I bought them a brownie at Starbucks, and I took the first bite because they needed to have that singleness of heart, right? <laughs> in verse 47, all the while, so in all of this, and on the teaching, and the fellowship, and the prayer, and the breaking of bread, and the worship, and all of that, they were praising God. The people, they were enjoying the goodwill of all the people. So the people that were witnessing this, this, this new community, this new faith family, celebrating together, worshiping together, fellowshipping together, learning together, that they, they had goodwill in the community. Now, it's going to be a few short chapters later where this goodwill kind of ends and the church starts getting persecuted, right? But a church that, that displays the, these kingdom values of teaching and fellowship and meals and prayer and worship and, and just being with one another, a church that does that, I guarantee you is going to stand out. I guarantee you that church is going to be different. In September, we have a couple from this church getting married. Carlos and Deb. You know, they asked me if they could have their wedding at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. You know what my answer was? Yes. You know how much fun we're going to have? At first I was like, yeah, it's a little weird, but yeah, let's do it. And ev almost every single person I've, I've mentioned that to, that we're going to do a wedding, we're going to be with somebody we're going to be with them for that day. I've been pretty excited about it. Pretty cool. So on the table back there, there's a pink sheet. I forgot to bring it up. Robin, can you, are you able to walk? Yeah. Okay. Go. You never know with foot surgeries and all of that. I'm, so hold it up. Wave it up. You see that? That's a pink sheet. That has every single one another command on it. When the Bible says love one another, care for one another, share one another's burdens, one another, one another, one another. Most of the time, that's within the context of the faith family, of believers. So we are to do that for one another, all right? I think there's 31 different ones. Love one another is by far the one that's repeated the most often. Um, but get that. Practice that. Like, close your eyes, point to one, and be like, I don't want to do that one. Okay, we'll do this one, right? <laughs> Let's be one another. Let's be with one another. That starts with... Every day of the week, waking up and saying, God, who do you want me to be with today? Send people into my life that I can be with. And then be silent. And if God brings a face, if God brings a name to mind, reach out to them. That's a, that's a beauty of technology, right? We can text, we can message, we can email, we can, God forbid, call people, right? I hate being on the phone. 
I do too. But sometimes God asks us to do what we don't like in order to bless other people. <clears throat> also, don't tell my wife I said that. <laughs> so, I'm going to ask a question now. And this, this kind of gets to the heart of what it means to be with one another. As you guys look around this room, okay, we're kind of a, a smaller faith family. We've definitely grown since... Um, uh, since we started the church. But how many of you guys, and don't answer this, this is rhetorical. How many of you know where people live and work? How many of you have one another's phone numbers? Yeah, I said don't answer, guys. That's part of what it means to be with. Checking in on one another. Calling one another. Spending time with one another. There's folks in this room that work crazy hours. Imagine calling them and saying, hey, I know you worked a 12 hour day. Um, this'll, be, this'll really be a stretch. Thank you for the key to your house. There's lasagna for you warming up in the oven. <laughs> we give Amazon access to our house. Why not the family of God? Right? But That'll also require you to learn who has concealed carry and things like that. But let's, <laughs> let, let's work together on being with one another, okay? And let's talk next week about how we as a church can be with God together, how we can be with one another together, how we can be in motion, on mission, together for the glory of God and for our good. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, it is such a privilege to worship you, to learn from your word. We are so thankful for the apostles' teachings. We are so thankful for the example that we're given in scripture to be with one another, to fellowship, to break bread, to pray, to worship, to study, to learn. Lord, help us as a church to know what it means for us in 2023 in Colorado Springs, in Cimarron Hills, in Old Farm, in Lorson Ranch, wherever we happen to live. Help us to be with and Lord, this isn't us manufacturing stuff, but this is as we live an abiding life in you, as we remain in you, as we love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, as we do that, we are going to love other people as ourselves. So help us do that together and help us do that for your glory. And all God's people said, amen. amen.